and welcome to our live Q&A with Eddie Izzard and Andy Goddard for the launch of the Sky original film Six Minutes to Midnight, which is available on Sky Cinema and the streaming service now. I'm Rihanna Dillon and we are live from the historic De La Ware Pavilion here in Bexhill on Sea, where the film, based on true events, is set. And we want you to get involved in tonight's Q&A, so if you have any questions for Eddie or Andy, please put it in the comments below. Now, before I introduce our incredible talent behind the film, let's remind ourselves of why we're here. Is this your first visit to Bexhill? Yes, it is. There's been an alliance between England and Germany here yeah, for many years. What sort of Englishman would accept a post teaching Herr Hitler's League of German Girls? The Führer would have us, sir. My father is Deutsch. I do not like surprises. They are the daughters of the Nazi High Command. As soon as there's movement, we'll take this school. England can be an unforgiving place if you happen to be German. It can often be hard to tell who someone really is. I have a list of Nazi conspirators, English traitors. This country is at war with Germany. Germany can't afford girls to be captured. Can you assure me you haven't been compromised? to stop this. My girls are not the enemy. The German, aren't they? It gives me great pleasure to introduce director Andy Goddard and the star and co-writer of Six Minutes to Midnight, Eddie Izzard. Welcome both. Hey, hello. Thanks very much. Great to be here. How are you? Well, good. We've arranged a brilliant sunset, I think. It's yeah, gorgeous. Lovely. It's we, what a beautiful place. Reminds us of the weather. Didn't we get amazing weather to shoot with? Yeah, it was glorious. We had the most fantastic summer. Yeah, so it was like when our story was about the last summer before the war, so we had this beautiful, I think the stars aligned and looked on us. We had an amazing summer. Yeah, in, in the weather. gods of weather were with us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It has been such a long time coming, but how does it feel to actually be in Bex Hill, where, of course, the film is set in this beautiful pavilion? Well, it's, it's great, and the fact that 128 Dorset Road is just over there, and that's where the school, the building that the school was in is still there. It's been turned into flats, and right now, it could be someone sitting there thinking, oh, I'll buy one of those, <laughs> and they don't even know that there's a film coming out right at the second, and they're buying a slice of that score. That is absolutely incredible, and I believe that the initial idea started here in Bexhill as well, at the yep. museum, which you're a patron of? Yeah, I grew up here 11 years of my life. My dad grew up here, Graham was born here. Um, I, cos I got a bit known, I became a patron of the museum, mm -hmm. and Julian Porter, the, the curator of the museum, he said, did you know that there used to be a 26 schools in Bexhill on Sea, which is an insane amount. And if, if people are watching in uh, UK and Ireland, this, this is South Coast, this is near Hastings, Brighton, Eastbourne, this kind of area. And 26 schools in a town is like crazy for one. And he said one of them had girl, was a girls' school, a finishing school, and they were German girls and they were learning English. And this was their blazer badge. So he showed me this badge, this sort of, cr oh. this, um, you know, crescent shaped badge. Um, and it had the British flag on and the Nazi flag right next to it. And I just thought, I mean, you don't want those two flags right next to each other at any time. And okay. this was in the 30s, and I thought, well, there's a film in that, and it all started on that day. So after the initial badge research, where did the rest of that journey take you research-wise? And how did it kind of appear on the film that we see? Well, I didn't think, to be honest, I didn't think these girls... Well, the more I looked into it, we found out that they were very Nazi-sympathetic. We have pictures of them from the Times newspaper of them in 1938, up in London, doing the Nazi salute on the streets of London. Um, and we know that they were listening to Hitler's speeches because we talked to an au pair, an English au pair, who was working with the girls and helping them learn their English, and she said they used to listen to Hitler's speeches and do the, the Nazi salute to the, the radio set. So we wanted that scene in, in the film, and it, that was the foundation 
of, of, of the truth of what was happening from 32 to 39. For seven years they were there. And then we built a story that went into our imagination and artistic licence after that. So, Andy, how did you get involved in the film? Why were you so keen to direct this? Well, our third amigo, um, Kellen Jones, uh, who plays Corporal Willis in the film, and he was the co-writer uh, with us on this film. Uh, I'd worked with Kellen on a movie called Set Fire to the Stars mm -hmm. about Dylan Thomas, and we'd known each other for a long time anyway, and we'd worked together, and we had our own kind of groove as, as co-writers. Uh, Kellen was working with Eddie on a BBC film called Castles in the Sky, and while working on Castles in the Sky, he was telling Eddie about the experience of Set Fire to the Stars. And it was a macro, low-budget film with Kellen and Elijah Wood, and we made it in a very kind of rootsy, punk DIY kind of way. We just kind of made it for very little money. It was like a, a kind of chamber piece. And I think Eddie was kind of fired up by the idea of, like, just getting up and making a film in that way. Mm -hmm. And, of course, he had this kind of burning passion for um, the film that became Six Minutes to Midnight. So when Kellen came to me about it, I think he'd been on a journey with Eddie on this project for at least a year, I would say, probably yeah. a little bit more. And I think it must have been some time around the back end of 2016 mm -hmm. into 2017 when I came on board. Because um, I hooked up with Kellen and I said, what are you doing? I'm doing this, I'm doing this, and I'm doing this project with, with Eddie. And then I read the script and just as Eddie said, it was the, the school badge. That was like the kind of the lodestone. That was the magnet that kind of pulled you in. And it was just the idea that this was a, a, a truth is stranger than fiction story yeah. wedded to a kind of period wrong man thriller. So it pushed a lot of buttons for me. I was excited by the idea of working with Eddie and I was looking to sort of continue the journey with, mm. with Kellen. So it was just a confluence of a lot of good things. Well, as you mentioned, Kellen Jones was supposed to be with us this evening, sadly isn't, so he decided to send a message instead to you both. So let's have a look at that. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Kellen Jones. I play Corporal Willis and I co-wrote uh, Six Minutes to Midnight with Eddie Izzard and Andy Goddard. And I am gutted I can't be with you tonight celebrating raising a glass to this extraordinary film that we're all so proud of. I wish I could be there, but sadly, uh, I'm sure other people feel the same. We're there in spirit and thrilled that people are enjoying the film or going to enjoy the film and enjoy the fruits of everybody's hard labour. I'm really, really proud of this piece of work, as we all are, and I uh, hope you enjoy it. When Eddie first showed me the school badge and asked me to come on this journey, uh, it was a no-brainer. I just had to say yes. I thought it was an extraordinary piece of uh, unknown sort of British social history and just the idea of making this um, as a jumping-off point to an entertaining, exciting, relevant and poignant um, pre-wartime thriller. It was an adventure I just had to come on. And I really hope you enjoy it. And I'm really glad that people are enjoying it. And I wish you all the very best. Thank you. I'm going to take him to task for not wearing a tie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he wasn't wearing his DJ. What yeah, was all that about? Already the, uh, with the dinner jacket. I think he's, yeah, he's, he's got another film that's just lined up and he's just, yeah. just about to start shooting that. And there was a COVID thing that came in. Oh, into there's the always a COVID thing. Yeah, I know. It's, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's going to be a future thing. Like in the old, yeah, well, <laughs> people are going to be able to say, oh, I can't go to that thing. I've got a COVID thing, even after it's long gone. I know. How long is that going to last? So, Eddie, tell us about the character of Thomas Miller and how he's our sort of guide through the story. Well, I, I, in, in doing promotion for the film, I started analysing this. I don't know what you think about this, Andy. He's almost like a representative, I think, of the, twen of the 21st century audience looking at yeah. back into it, because mm -hmm. he's trying to... He's, he, he can see that the world is going to, going to hell right here, and there, it, it's about to all fall apart. Mm -hmm. And Hitler has, is trying to get all the young people, all the boys and girls, and get them in his grasp. And if he can just save one girl, mm -hmm. maybe from the, in the hearts and minds, the battle for hearts and minds, that's what he's there to do. But he can see this tragedy unfolding, and he is half German. His dad is German, and his mother's English. And um, I think, you know, the British wouldn't trust him because he's half German mm -hmm. and the Germans don't trust him because he's half British. So, and he's uniquely untrusted, but he is a representative of, of just seeing, trying to see things through a humanity uh, perspective. And 
and the girls are just going to, a lot of them are going to lose it. They're going to go into a war, they're going to get totally fired up with this, but maybe one or two won't. Maybe one or two might think about it. I love just kind of how incredulous he is throughout the whole thing. That's our sort of way in, I think. He's sort of so disbelieving about how this could be happening. Well, I, I think he feels the tragedy of it, but also the first third of the film, he's not who he is. Yeah, So you that's can't true. act that. You just have to act... Uh, you have to give nothing away. But, yeah, I, I felt you have to have wheels turning but, but nothing visible so that the audience can't read it and, and the, the girls can't read it, Miss Rockwell can't read it, mm. Elsa Keller can't read it, what, what, what's going on, which is a, um, an intriguing thing, but kind of invisible acting is um, it's, it's tricky to do. Yeah. Well, do you want to introduce this clip of you, him, in action? Yes, this is just after I've met with Miss Rockwell, Judy Dench's character. I, I, I've come in as an English teacher. She's immediately given me a job, which I wasn't expecting, <laughs> and throw me in the deep end with the girls. Yeah. Um, but I am half English, half German. The girls don't realise this. The last teacher was just an English teacher teaching them English. So this is what unfolds when uh, they don't realise that I'm actually fluent in German. Let's take a look. What about a story, a romantic story, <laughs> about a young man who misses his sweetheart? Is that you, Mr. Miller? No. Der Führer würde sagen, dass er nicht manns genug. Der Führer würde was sagen? It was day one, I think, wasn't it? That was, day, it was day one or day two. That was one of the first That was things. really early That was one of the first... I know the classroom was the first thing we shot. I would have thought was, it was... Of the whole film? Yeah, yeah. Wow. Day, day it, one. In at the deep end. It yeah. looked quite intimidating. Because I was developing it a long time, you know, and, you know, before... And then Kellen came on board, then Andy came on board. But, of course, because we are... We're independently financed, um, we didn't know we were really going. And I remember thinking... When I heard that Judy Dench was doing costume fittings, I was going, I think we're going to film this. <laughs> and that was two weeks before we went. Yeah. Oh, so. my God, what, it was that late? Yeah, well, it, it happens, it happens. Oh, you know, wow. you just, you're you never quite sure. And if you know of film stories, people can get into films and then they all, it all just isn't yes. happening. well, that's true. So um, it was wing and a prayer. And then the be most beautiful weather in the world came to join us yeah. for, the, for our one last amazing. summer. Incredible. Oh, I mean, you know, you mentioned Judy Dench. This does have an incredible ensemble cast, as well as Carla Yuri, James Darcy, my fave, Jim Broadbent. And it must have been a writer's dream to just see all of these talented, legendary actors breathe life into your story and your characters. It is beautiful. Do you want to take that? Yeah, I mean, and it's such a... One of the things I really loved about this film was the, the female-centric cast and also there's just this wonderful sort of demographic. You have yeah. these young teenage German girls, these amazing European uh, young actresses that we cast out of Berlin. I saw about 70 girls on tape. Um, the sort of the, the hit rate of talent was amazing. You could have cast almost like 25. We had this process of elimination, and then with our casting director, Colin Jones, I went to Berlin and I met the sort of the six girls who became our main sex. Mm. And they auditioned for each other's roles just so we could get the dynamic right. And I just love the idea of this sort of young European talent in a movie with Eddie, with, with Judy, with Jim. And then you have uh, some sort of maverick talent like Carla Yuri. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's uh, I mean, it's a real actor's movie, and you know, I'm Maverick just... is a great way to describe her. I think. Yeah, she's she's one of the sort of take homes for this film. I yeah. think. I think her performance is a standout, and she has such a uh, organic process. And that role, arguably more than any others, was sort of tailored around her and mm -hmm. her process, um, and because the character is so, you know, she's been torn from the inside out. She's been being pulled in different directions and and although she sort of develops into the antagonist role without giving too many spoilers away i think there are pendulum shifts of sympathy for her at various times we can see that she's a woman under duress with the weight of <clears throat> circumstance and history upon her um, we were keen to make her more than just a sort of 2d villain she, yes. she had to feel rounded mm -hmm. And also, Callan Jones, not only being co-writer, but also in the film, playing Corporal Willis, along with um, James Darcy playing Captain Dre. The, I liked the idea from the beginning that the heavies 
were British and not German. Because yes. you'd always think, well, the heavies, the people who are going to be the most, the darkest in, uh, force in it, you would think, well, that's going to be the German. No, mm -hmm. let's make them the British. I like the idea of that. And they're from the Cabinet Office, which is, <laughs> which is the thing. <laughs> what is the Cabinet Office? <laughs> the Cabinet yeah. Office is the NSA of, of British imagination. <laughs> Um, because there is the CIA and the FBI mm -hmm. and the NSA, and you never quite know what the NSA is. Well, that's the Cabinet Office in <laughs> my mind. That's why they're from the Cabinet Office. I think that's fair enough. Um, Andy, you are used to working with legendary British talent. You directed Maggie Smith, Dame Maggie Smith, in Downton Abbey. What was your highlight of shooting with Dame Judi Dench? Because she's such a presence on screen. Yeah, um, I mean, it was like a list of one. We were always like, wouldn't it be amazing if Judy could do this? And I think we have Eddie to thank because of the Victorian Abdul connection. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and as Eddie's talked about, Judy's got this, <clears throat> this kind of youth to her, which I think is kind of the, the secret to her longevity. And uh, what really excited us about her in this role in particular, more than any other actor I can think of, is that there is almost like a kind of uh, a perceived public persona of Judy Dench. Mm -hmm. As an audience, we kind of love her and we feel that we know her. And I think several generations now have grown up with her, uh, with her, her work in the cinema especially. So kind of casting her against the grain in, in this role of someone who has... Uh, she, this is a character who's having an outer dialogue and an inner dialogue. The outer dialogue is kind of apologising for Sieg Heilin and embracing... Uh, some of the rhetoric of Hitler uh, and justifying it, saying, you know, uh, it's not a bad thing for a nation to feel proud about itself. And yet there is an inner dialogue going on at the same mm. time where I think there's, a, there's an inner voice saying mm, something's just a bit off, but she's not listening to that voice. And so there is that kind of duality within her. And then as you see, the story progresses, you know, um, the scales fall away from her eyes and, mm. and she she's woken up to the fact. But her... Her through line is all about the girls. Uh, you know, she may make some wrong choices yeah. in the earlier acts of the movie, but it's coming from a good place. Mm -hmm. It's coming from the love for her girls. Yeah. Mm. She's such an interesting character. Yeah. We've actually got some more messages from your co-stars that couldn't make it today. Let's start with the rather dashing James Darcy. Hi guys, um, I just want to say I'm, I'm sorry I can't be with you tonight at Bex Hill, um, mainly because you didn't invite me. Um, I'm going to assume that's because of the uh, pandemic and not because you didn't want me. It, it couldn't be that you didn't want me to come, could it? Um, we had such a good time making the film, uh, not Kellen, I didn't have any fun with him, but obviously with Eddie and Judy just great. Andy, fantastic director, and I'm so happy for everyone that the film is coming out. I hope you have a fantastic evening this evening, and here's to a great success, except, except for Kellen. Anyone but Kellen. All right, bye-bye. I was, would, it was great when James was on the set and chatting with Judy. They'd, uh, they'd just go into a kind of a huddle, and, and I think they were doing just Hollywood stories, which is... A really good reason to be in this business is just for <laughs> film stories, people talking about things. But uh, yeah, James is fantastic. So he is invited, and he, if you can come, James, if you can come now. <laughs> and here he so, is. <laughs> if you can get a rocket, you can come right now. Um, yes, it's COVID. I, I wanted everyone. I wanted bells and whistles. We're going to have sky trackers later. We're going to have when the when the sun goes. Look at this sunset. Oh, it's it ridiculous. Is absolutely stunning. This is the Algarve. You couldn't have picked a better day for this either. You might think because actually, if you're watching at home anywhere in uh, the UK, Ireland, where, where you can link into this, you might think that because people like this back projection. This is not a back projection. If you can <laughs> see this, but I don't know if the camera's picking this up. But that's a real bloody sunset. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, it's been freezing up to now. So we arranged this. This is a special thing just between please. Sky and us and Matters Birds. <laughs> and Ali, we just said, can we have some nice weather? Because <laughs> it could have been just teeming. You know the British sunset, <laughs> seaside, and the sunset. Yeah. Well, I mean, the British seaside, you captured so perfectly on screen. And you also managed to get that real feel and tension of the late 1930s as well. So tell us about having to make this in Penarth in Wales and how come that lent itself to, <laughs> to pre-war Sussex. 
Yeah, we had Welsh funding, so 99.9, 9, 95% of the film was shot in Wales. Mm -hmm. I'd filmed in Wales a lot. Both Kellen and I are Welshmen. I've, I've worked in Wales a lot, so... I'm uh, honorary Welsh. Oh, yeah. I, yeah, I lived in Skewen when I was a kid, so I've been... There you go. There you yeah, go. Honorary Welsh. Um, and we should give a shout-out to Penarth, Llandidno... Um, Llan Stefan. Llan Stefan Castle. Stunt, stunt casting for, for uh, Pevensey. So a lot of great Welsh locations. Yeah, we did this kind of grand tour of Wales. It was a very location-heavy film. Uh, we were in the school for about two weeks uh, in Carmarthenshire. Gestly Eyre. Gestly Eyre, uh, Golden Grove, this, this beautiful old building. Um, we had a fantastic production designer, Candida Otten, who I'd worked with before. Uh, Chris Seeger, our director of photography, who I worked with a lot. Uh, we're like a married couple. We're sort of joined at the head. We, we, we work together quite a lot. Um, uh, I mean, you just surround yourself with brilliant, talented mm. people who kind of make you look good. I mean, we did a lot of research, and obviously we're just trying to find locations that kind of fed into that kind of pre-war, I guess, architecture that was kind of post-Victorian but had survived to the 1930s, hadn't been bombed in the war, and yet at the same time had survived the kind of the town planning kind of blitz of the 60s. Mm. So it was a very kind of... We had a shopping list of very specific locations. And Wales, um, it, it really delivered the goods, you know? We had to travel a lot to kind of... And can I say great stunt casting for Sussex? Because Wales is dressed up as Sussex. Yeah. Wales doesn't know this at the time, but that's what, that's what of course, course, we're based, and this is where we are now. Mm -hmm. And there is one, if you watch the trailer, you will see, actually, the day of shooting that we did in Sussex, which is just over there, the head then there, which is Eastbourne, and on that beach where I grew up, and we did that, and you were directing, I was acting there, but Kellen was... Uh, uh, first AD, first, first assistant director on that day, oh and I was casting, I was doing casting directing and location <laughs> managing, <laughs> wasn't I? So I found the location, I got the five policemen into it who were kids from school and um, people, people that I just met and said, do you want to be a policeman? So... Uh, it was it, the last day of the show, yeah. For, for background artists, yeah, it was... Oh, fantastic. There's no dialogue, it was just like no, a silent movie. It, it, was, just, it was kind of a beautiful... Yelling thing. at Eddie to come back as he was <laughs> running over the head. And there's a pinnacle yeah. of rock you can see where I... I, I and if you watch the film, you can see me hanging off this pinnacle of rock. And Amanda Searle, who did a wonderful stills photographer, took all the stills, and she said, you know, it's really dangerous what you're doing up there. And I said, it's not dangerous. Because I've been there since I was seven years old, you know, playing as a kid. She said, it is. And I said, look, come on, I'll go up. And I stood on the cliff of this short cliff. Yeah. And I thought, actually, this is quite dangerous. <laughs> but did that ever... Be... Did you ever think about that? Because I... It looked dangerous. When yeah, it was I, I realised, which is good for the camera, but I dangerous. actually wasn't scared at all. But when I look back at it now, it actually looks rather dangerous. <laughs> I'm standing on the cliff edge, just not... Didn't give a monkey. Kids are so much braver, aren't they? No, it, it's something to do with you, but it's also that... It's a very special pinnacle. If you go to... It's called Pinnacle Point, uh, the, just by the Downs in Eastbourne, and it's, it, it's chalk that doesn't crumble, which is just odd, because chalk always crumbles, yeah. and that's been there for decades, and I don't know why. Oh, fabulous. Fabulous filming locations. So which scene did you enjoy writing the most, and which scene did you enjoy shooting the most? Oh. Um... Oh, I've put you on the spot there. I'm not sure. Well, the, well, the shooting, the, the, the one with, with Gretel on the, on the, the roof oh, of the, the school... Yeah. Um, that wasn't... I think that was more Kellen writing on that one, but that was a great one uh, to shoot. Um, um, anything with the girls, working with the girls, was, was, was good for me. Yeah. And, in fact, because I wanted to have this connection and, and it was difficult to find uh, overt connections that would, that would link with them, I, I performed my, my show in German to them wow. to have a... If, if it wasn't a Thomas thing, merging a Thomas... Um, Miller link with a with a, my my own personal link. So I, I said, if you want to watch it, I'll do forty five minutes of my my other day job, which You're is where I talk up. weird comedy <laughs> to them in German. And they sat under a tree near Gethli uh, near near the school, and and I did my, the show in German. So that was that was a very beautiful and odd day. But yeah. fantastic. Yeah, all the shooting around the school was amazing. Well, actually, coming up the staircase, I've had that, that idea of the staircase thing. The staircase was a, was a character in itself. The school was a character, but the staircase yeah. is stunning. Yes. And to have the girls all singing there was one thing, and to, to walk up the staircase with all the girls just staring at you, it's just... It kind of... There was no writing in it. It was completely... You know, it kind of took time. me back to the sound of music, that scene. Yes, you know, it's, there it's, are kind of, it's kind of, of twisted sound of music. Yeah. Sound of music crossed with um, 
what's the Australian uh, girls? Uh, Picnic, Picnic at Hanging Rock. Rock. Oh, yes. yes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Which was always swirling underneath what we were doing. Great inspirations. Now, this next clip I really want to talk about because I feel like it's a really pivotal point in the film where we first discover that darker side of the school that we've been talking about. So let's take a look at that. That happened. We know that happened. That, not that Thomas was listening in on it, but no. they were listening to those speeches and they were they were doing the the Nazi salute to the to the radio. I mean, I, I love in that scene. You don't even need dialogue. Everything is just done in those glances, and you just n can tell all you need to know from the characters in that. Yeah. Why you you kind of make sure that you don't come down too heavily on either side. Of, any, of anyone, you know, there are so many grey areas that you've written into the characters. How come? Um, when you say don't come... Well, hopefully we're not on the Nazi side that No, way. of course not, but you always show empathy, I suppose, at every sort of time. Well, it's, it's the battle for hearts and minds. Well, see, I thought... I don't know what you thought about this, Andy, whether I talked to you about it, but my, my, always my worry about World War II is what would I have done if I, if I was a kid growing up in Germany and the country that I was growing up in had lost the First World War? If a guy who came along who said everyone's got to be Aryan even though all the Nazi high command looked anything but Aryan, yeah. which is a bit <laughs> odd, just along with all the oddities that they had, and they said, well, I'm going to make you great and here's a, a lot of flags repeated endlessly and, and you can get badges and this is and daggers, and would I have... Would I have gone with it, mm. you know? Would I have signed up for this? Would I have been able to put a block to it and say, this is God? As, a, as, a, as an adult, hopefully, as a kid, as a teenager? Yeah. I don't know. This is, this is always my worry. Because I said this to the girls. What happened then, we're not trying to say that countries can be bad, countries can be good, but ideas can be bad and ideas can be good. So it's the idea of the extreme right, the, the line that's saying this country is the best, the best in the world and, and other countries should be enslaved to us. It is, it's a nonsense, it's an insanity. Mm. And the, Germany was pulled into it. I think Hitler kidnapped the country for 12 years. Mm. Germany was just like any other European country. We'd all had wars, we'd all fought like this, but they were sucked, sucked into this and then kidnapped the country for 12 years and it was a madness and... Um, 60 million people died. Yeah. It was a difficult scene to shoot. I mean, that, that was, you know, we kind of... Yeah, you had to shoot it every which way. Yeah, I mean, and it was... It, 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 I think more than any other scene, it's probably the one scene that sums up the film. If someone said, what's the film about? And, and I could show them that yeah. sequence and I think it, it tells you so much of, of what the film is about and, uh, and, and Thomas's place within that story. Um, you know, but you know, we we had these young German actresses, and it, you know, we they had to do it like three hundred times. I mean, it was one of those scenes. Even though we were on a very strict schedule, um, I knew we had to cover that scene properly. Mm -hmm. and, and there's so many reactions, and there's there's so many connections between different characters happening in that scene. Uh, and I just love that kind of that stutter step that Judy does, that slight hesitance before she does it, yeah. and, and that's the idea of being swept along by it. Um, and as Eddie said, you know, you kind of go, well, I wouldn't do that, but you don't know, you know. Wow. And you see, and it, it's a very good point you're saying there, because you see Gretel as someone 
who is reluctantly, I have to do this, otherwise I'm going to get my head kicked in because mm -hmm. they were such... This is bullying. The extreme right uses violence and the threat of violence. Mm -hmm. And the threat of violence is as powerful as the violence itself. Just the threat, people will back down from this. Um, and then there's Judy's character, who's n got no skin in the game, yeah. as we would say. She's English, she doesn't have to go with this, but she's been caught up in this fervor. Mm -hmm. I always thought, uh, I said this to Judy, that she'd gone to the, her character had gone to the 36 Olympics, the Nazi Olympics, where they, they stage managed the whole thing and they, they took all the anti-Jewish um, propaganda away and they made themselves look really friendly and nice. We're nice Nazis. And so all the visiting people said, well, they seem really nice, they seem okay, I can't see any problems. And I think she went to that Olympics, her character did. And so she was beguiled by mm. this, this evil, twisted thing, even though underneath it she knows yeah. something's wrong. Mm. It's a back to that inner dialogue, you know, she takes her arm down when she sees Thomas Hodgson, so he, why does she do that, yes. you know? Um, yeah, it was... Uh... Well, Andy, how do you feel that the themes of Six Minutes to Midnight will resonate with today's audience, and who are you hoping will see it? Um, I'm hoping uh, a younger generation will connect with it. Um, maybe a, a younger generation that may um, not be as genned up on history, perhaps, as Eddie and I are, just yeah. simply because we're older. Um, just, you know, learn from history. Like, like uh, as Eddie has said before, you know, we have been going through a turbulent period in our modern history on both sides of the Atlantic where many of the ugly aspects of the 1930s seem to have been with us again, with the rise of the far right, hate crime, uh, and just the whole issue of how we treat a common man across borders. Uh, and so, yes, we want to entertain with a period thriller story, but at the same time, we like to think that some of the themes that are ingrained in the DNA of this film, we can hold up a mirror and say, you know, it is... I think the best period stories um, have something to say about the way we live today. Mm. Um, and that was always one of the draws for me, not just to... Um, you know, we wanted to sort of make a love letter to the movies that we loved, those kind of Hitchcock and thrillers of the 30s and the 40s. But we thought, wouldn't it be um, meaningful if we could say something a little deeper mm -hmm. and kind of, um, you know, with a nod to what we've been going through? So, yeah. Those who do not learn from history are doomed to repeat it. Mm -hmm. And... We look like we're repeating some of it right mm -hmm. now. And you could say, well, some could say, oh, that's alarmist about Donald Trump. But there's two things he did. One, Hitler said, the big lie is easier to sell than the small lie. Which sounds, what does that mean? Well, Donald Trump came along and said he won an election that he patently, obviously, did not win. And then a whole percentage of people in America went along with it, still going along with it. Mm -hmm. And that's a lie. Republican administrators of the election are saying, no, you didn't win this. And, and Trump was trying to bully them. And also, if you look at it, if Hitler had been voted out after four years, then the whole of the Second World War wouldn't have happened. So... What happens in America, what happened if, if the far-right politicians around the world, the simplistic politicians who say, here are a number of things which are untrue, but I'm, I'm going to put them to you and I'd like you to vote for me because of these untrue things. It's a very scary place to mm. go to. And we went there before. Let's hope we don't go there again. And thinking back to when you first... That sort of seed of writing the film first came to you, why was it so important for you to tell this story? Well, I wanted to tell as many stories as I can. So this is not... This is my, might be my, the first film I've co-written, but it's not the last. So That's it just happens to be one. It was sitting there, it was screaming out. Mm -hmm. A film must be made of this. And, and so it was made, but it's not the last. <laughs> that is good news. We have got some more messages from your co-stars. This time we're going to hear from some of the girls that you've been so effusive about. Can't wait to hear from them. Hi, guys. Sorry I can't be there tonight, but I'm out on location shooting. And I just want to say how much I love being part of this movie and Eddie... Danke für diese tolle Zusammenarbeit. Du bist eine riesen Inspiration für mich und ich habe sehr viel von dir gelernt. Oh, and I made some calls and got some of the class back together. Enjoy. Eddie, I miss you and I hope you enjoy the movie tonight. Guys, thank you all for giving me the chance to work with you. It was so much fun and I'll never forget it. Hi, 
I'm very sad that I can't be with you tonight, but I'm sending love and greetings from rainy Berlin and I wish you a wonderful premiere and hope to see you all live soon. I'm so happy everyone is getting to see the film. Thanks guys. Hi Eddie, it's your favorite pupil Astrid here. I hope you told everybody how amazing I am. Hmm? Guys, I really hope you have an amazing night. I'm so stoked for the film to finally come out. Please, let's see each other soon. Sending you lots of love from Berlin. Mwah. Great uh, command of English, isn't it? For, oh, it's the, great. The German girls. The, the uh, young German kids really have amazing English. I know this because I go and perform there. But um, we had to actually make them get slightly worse at their <laughs> English. Yeah, we had uh, a brilliant dialect coach, Richard Ryder. Mm -hmm. uh, and, of course... 1930s German is phonetically not the same as, as modern German. Yeah. And, you know, and some of these girls, you know, they travelled and maybe a little bit of Americanese had crept mm -hmm. into the German, so we had to kind of iron all that out and sort of take them back to the 1930s. Yeah. Uh, they, were, they were fab. Yeah. yeah. And it was great because there were six uh, German girls and 14 uh, British girls who were the background artists uh -huh. to make up 20 girls. And I... I asked the German girls who are actors who are normally kept separate from background artists, would you mind if, if everyone mixed together so mm. there was this feel of all 20 gelling, you know, girls, all one group? Yeah. And they were OK for that, so that's, that's how it feels. Because yeah. when they walk along the cliff edge, you can't tell. No. no. Yeah. It's seamless. And also, that. Astrid will always terrify me now. <laughs> Forevermore, I think. Um, we have some questions from our audience who have been watching live. Yeah. So this is from Stephen Hardy. Thank you for sending this in. Why Six Minutes to Midnight as a title? That's a good question. Well, it came from my initial title was 12 Minutes to Midnight. Oh. <laughs> um, and it you was, it it. was clock ticking towards a kind of, you know, what's going to happen at midnight. Um, and I knew in the back of my mind that there was a, a clock out there in the world that, that had this countdown thing. And then I, I, I said, I got a good, I, had, I, I came up with this idea before I'd actually really looked into that. It's called the Doomsday Clock. And I worked, oh. so if you Google the Doomsday Clock, you actually find at the moment that it's like at one minute to midnight. It's really close to, you know, with all the simplistic politicians around the world. <laughs> so uh, we m thought we'd better change it from 12 minutes and make it slightly closer <laughs> to midnight. So we had a yeah. six or a five. There were a lot of numerical discussions. Yeah. And Two Minutes to Midnight is an Iron Maiden song, I think. Isn't it? Iron oh, Maiden is it? Got a, is it? Couldn't yeah. still two that. Midnight, and, there's and, a... and there's some other... Someone's got... Th yeah, so... But six... <laughs> six sounded good. Six yeah. sounded good. Yeah. Five could have been, but six was... <laughs> six. six is like a punchy sort of... Yeah. Um, this next one is from Phoebe Grant. Thanks, Phoebe. It's a serious subject matter, but were there any particularly funny moments you had whilst filming? Sounds like there probably were loads. Yeah, there was, and I think it's important. It, uh, I mean, there's, there's, there's a lot of light and shade in this film, yeah. but even when we're going through some of the dark material, I think it's important to try and keep spirits up and, um, you know, just, just, just sort of set a really, like, nice working atmosphere on set. Yeah, I mean, especially with Judy. I mean, you know... Oh, yeah. Judy was always, always a laugh. She loved a flutter on the horses and... <laughs> Um, we had a sweepstake. Well, she had a loose tooth, and we had a sweepstake about when her tooth would fall out. And, uh, who won? I can't remember. <laughs> I can't remember who won that one. And wasn't Kellen buying ice cream? Kellen was buying Swansea? ice cream. Uh, yeah, for, for people, yeah. for, for the cast. And, uh, oh. and the girls were always getting giddy and telling jokes in German, and, uh, you know, which I was sort of always on the back foot trying to keep up. Yeah, you have uh, to have your head in everything. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds like a lovely set. And this is from, from um, Siobhan uh, Wicks, who has asked a great question. Was the bus driver, played by Jim Broadbent, based on your granddad? Yes. My granddad is Charlie... Charles Harold Izzard. Charlie Izzard. And he drove a bus and he drove vans and he had a motorbike. He loved his machines. Quite a dapper dresser. And there was a... There was a whisper that he had... Um, no, he had another woman that he was seeing up in Uckfield, oh, in Uckfield. during the war because he was never at home because because he was driving he had to be out driving he was too young for the first war and too old for the second world war um, but um, this was the story and since I've been doing press on this someone from Eastbourne phoned me up and saying your I knew your granddad Charlie Izzard and he bought used to buy fish and chips from his shop and he and 
apparently granddad, and it did sound like my granddad, but he said he'd gone out in a boat. He, he, he bought a boat, and I didn't know granddad ever had a boat, but he went out and he wasn't very good with the boats. And there was a kid with him, and the kid almost drowned because the, the boat capsized, oh, and they goodness. saved the kid. And, and I said, well, it wasn't me, and it wasn't, I don't think it was my brother, so maybe it was a child of a, maybe there was a fancy oh, one. Really? I don't know, I'm extrapolating this. <laughs> but that, yes, Charlie is <laughs> our... Um, Charlie, the bus driver, is was dad. But he didn't have his own car. He didn't live in a farmhouse, mm -hmm. but he lived up at uh, up at Sidley, just north Bexhill, with my grandma sometimes when she was there. Go this on. all I found out this out later, but uh, and he was really into Thunderbirds. Was granddad? Oh, interesting. I know because I love those We used quirks. to watch Thunderbirds when we were kids. <laughs> <laughs> When we come over for Sunday lunch, he said, come on, come on, come and sit down. And he'd be watching it. Stingray and Thunderbirds. That's what Grandad was watching. <laughs> and Jim Broadbent just came to mind for that well, role. Well, Jim was up for playing the uh, 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 Charlie. And, uh, and also had this great speech, which unfortunately, due to the tempo of the movie, he didn't take out. No one likes a traitor um, speech, but... And he was driving the bus. Yeah, he, he was, was driving, driving the bus. bus. Yeah, well, actually, I said completely... I actually, I remember because they said, we'll get the stuntman to do this. And I said, can't, we, can't Jim do it? I think Jim would like to do it. And later on, I saw an interview and Jim said, I was really pleased to drive. <laughs> and so I was very pleased that I, yeah. I did say, well, let's try it. Because he was in there driving along. Yeah. And then I leap out. That was good. That was so much fun. Unfortunately, that is all that we've got time for here at Delaware Pavilion in Bexhill on Sea. The sun has set both here and on our interview, which is really sad. A big thank you to our very special guests, star and co-writer Eddie Izzard and director Andy Goddard. And, of course, thank you to all of you for watching at home. Six Minutes to Midnight, a Sky original film, is available on Sky Cinema and the, Sky, the, and the streaming service now. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Thanks, Thanks Thank very much. you very much. Thank you.